Hi, everyone. Today's episode is the topic I have been waiting to discuss for a long time, relationships. Most everyone who learns about the Myers-Briggs wants to learn about how it applies to relationships. Do opposites attract or do birds of a feather flock together? Mark and I are going to delve into this topic, specifically romantic relationships, which is always a fun topic to discuss. And folks, this is our final episode of this first season of the new Myers-Briggs Question Corner. So if you haven't yet, please, please give us a like, a comment, a share, and that way we know we're bringing you great content and we can keep going for another season. And if you've already been tuning in, big thanks to you. We truly appreciate your support. Now, let's talk about relationships. Welcome to the new Myers-Briggs Question Corner. I'm Edith Richards. And I'm Mark Maffey. And we're here to answer your questions about all things personality and all things Myers-Briggs. From college to careers to relationships, personality is the key to finding the right fit. Welcome, everyone. Really looking forward to today's episode. MBTI and romantic relationships. Can understanding of MBTI types help us in the romantic relationship process, attraction, dating, romance, and long-term relationships? If we have an understanding of our MBTI and how it might have an impact on others, would that help us in how we relate with others? These are some of the things that we're going to discuss in this episode. So with that question, would our understanding of MBTI, would that have a significant impact on how we relate with others, Edith? Yeah. So Mark, that's a really loaded question, um, but it's fun and useful <laughs> to discuss this question. So so let's see, actually brought up a bunch of different questions there. So let me see if I can break it down. So first, does having an understanding of our MBTI type preferences and how we might impact others, does that help us in relating to each other? And second, how can this understanding help us in attracting the right partner? And I'm going to add this part too. Can understanding our type preferences help in sustaining a relationship? Did I get that right? How was that, Mark? Absolutely. That's exactly what I wanted to, to talk about. Okay, great. So let me let me dive right into this then. So first, regarding how the MBTI can help us relate to each other. So let's start with that one. So first, the Myers-Briggs assessment isn't a tool that was designed specifically to use with relationships, romantic or otherwise. There is no psychometric out there that can accurately predict relationship success. So let me just get that part out there. Personality is such a complex topic. And as much as some people might want to argue with me on this, personality isn't quantifiable or diagnosable. <laughs> but the Myers-Briggs can be a powerful tool to help in understanding each other, and it can help challenges in relationships if it's used correctly. So let me take a brief step back here. I get a lot of questions about this, and people who are new to the Myers-Briggs often want to learn what the types of their friends and family members and significant others are and which types they'll be most compatible with. So it's really easy to fall into this path of what we call typecasting. I know we've mentioned this in previous podcasts. And really what that means is assigning certain characteristics to a person or assuming that they like or don't like certain things solely on the basis of their four-letter Myers-Briggs type. Mm -hmm. So let me stress this. 
just because you have a certain personality type doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to enjoy the same things as someone else with your same personality type. There are a lot of other factors that go into compatibility. So there will be similarities, especially in how you approach life and and people you may be naturally comfortable with and things like that. But it's important to remember that each of us, aside from a Myers-Briggs type, is still an individual with unique traits and a unique path in life. So quick example here. I've talked about my own type quite a bit on this podcast. I'm an ENFP type. And just the other day, I was chatting with another ENFP friend of mine, and I was actually struck by how different we really are. We've taken different career paths, for example, but we both enjoy motivating others and brainstorming, which are hallmarks of our type. Yet we both have completely different tastes in music and movies and books. And then there's our taste in men. (laughs) That's completely different. But aside from these things, we have very similar outlooks on life. At least I feel this way. And we have different paths, but we're both clearly ENFPs. So I say this to say that we should be careful of not forgetting that we're still individuals aside from a personality type. And there's way more to how the Myers-Briggs is measured. Essentially, it's a system of measuring binary distribution of four dichotomies of personality traits. And when we're talking about things like relationships, there's really no way to quantify or measure them in a scientific, accurate sense. These are all great points. And I think it's something very important for us to understand so we don't use the Myers-Briggs for something that it wasn't intended to be used for. A lot of times we talked about typecasting, right? We don't want to use that in order to do that. But I definitely love some of the things that you talked about, when it comes to relating with somebody, there's more that goes into it than just personality types. There's tons of things and tons of other factors that go into what makes you compatible, what makes you get along with individuals. But I do think, I do love what you said here. The Myers-Briggs can be a powerful tool though in understanding each other. And I, I hope that this can be a theme that we mention throughout this episode is using the Myers-Briggs as a way to understand each other so that way we can better relate with each other. And I think that's kind of what we want you to use. Don't use the Myers-Briggs to typecast. Use the Myers-Briggs to increase our understanding so that way we can use our relationship skills to better relate with each other. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point that you made there. And in terms of this understanding of how personality type can help us in terms of, because we're talking about romantic relationships here, right? In terms of attraction, dating, romance, and long-term relationships. So let me just say that this is my opinion. I tend to believe that the more similar we are in terms of personality, the easier it is to connect with somebody. But I also admit that this isn't always true, right? Chemistry and compatibility goes way beyond personality type to your earlier point, Mark. And it goes beyond anything that the Myers-Briggs measures. But when I meet another ENFP type, more often than not, I can very easily make a connection with that person because of the similar traits that we share. And I just almost always walk away feeling like I've met one of my people, like a member of my tribe. And that feels really good because the other person just gets you. Now, does that always translate into chemistry in terms of a romantic relationship? No, not really, or not always. So just speaking for myself, I tend to be romantically attracted to people who Mm. are very different from me. Opposites attract, right? But on the other hand, I often make connections with other people of very opposite types who sometimes feel like they belong in my tribe. And and speaking of that, one thing I do like to point out in these 
types of conversations is that one of the greatest growth opportunities that we have is with someone else with a different personality type. So what I'm trying to say here is that there are there's so many nuances when it comes to talking about relationships. There's not really any black or white, so mm. to speak. The, the other thing I want to point out is that I firmly believe that any two healthy, well-developed individuals of any Myers-Briggs type can have a successful relationship. Interesting. So what you're saying is that two people of the same type may be compatible, but maybe not. There's really no certain way to tell, right? But I like what you said about opposites attracting. And from an MBTI perspective, we may be able to intuit what relationship challenges they experience and where they might find joy in each other. And one of the things that I've always said a lot of times on this podcast is that opposites kind of complete each other just because we bring different things that are needed in a relationship or a partnership or teamwork. It brings different things together that allows you to complete a certain task. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you don't mind, may I take your type, for example, Mark? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so you're an INFP type. You've shared that with our audience before. So let's take a look at your opposite, which is an ESTJ type. We can, um, to your point, intuit what a relationship between these two might look like. So I'll first say that there may be some natural chemistry here because of the whole opposites attract thing and what we were talking about. An ESTJ type might be drawn to your natural warmth, Mark, and you may be drawn to an ESTJ's tendency to plan and organize, especially with social events that the two of you can attend together. So, so these two types can complement each other. And when we're attracted to someone who's our opposite, it's often because of these differences. And we can mm-hmm. see things in that person that we don't see in ourselves. I think some other good things about INFP and ESTJ pairing is that ESTJs tend to be very stable people. They tend to be loyal and dependable. And this can complement your calm demeanor, Mark, and your your kindness, your ability to look at the big picture and think about the future. And of course, your creativity. These are all things that are not natural strengths of an ESTJ type. And another, another thought I have here is that an ESTJ partner can probably help you come out of your shell uh, a bit more than you might otherwise. They can help you to be more outspoken on things that you're passionate about. So, so those are a few things that come to mind here about, about opposites attract and, and compatibility. So now let's talk about some of the challenges here with this type pairing. I can see a couple of areas of frustration here. And one would be lifestyle orientation, making plans and coming to closure. And the other thing that that I'm, I'm thinking is uh, different communication needs. So for the first, ESTJ types tend to see the world in black and white. They tend to want tangible, not theoretical results. So they're going to focus on the immediate problem at hand, and they're going to try to fix it. And they're going to dole out a list of responsibilities for who is going to do what. They are going to get frustrated if something comes up that disrupts their schedule, because at the end of the day, ESTJs are ruled by clocks and calendars. Mm -hmm. So they may expect, for example, for all the household chores to be complete before they can relax. So they may expect all the household chores to be complete before they can relax. And this may stress you out, Mark, because as an INFP, you may prefer to work in bursts and spurts when your inspiration moves you to do so. You don't necessarily have a plan with a with a list and that can frustrate an ESTJ. And then there's the communication needs. So ESTJs tend to be rigid and they expect the rest of the world to be just like them. They want to decide things. They want to check a box. But as an INFP, Mark, you're on this like perpetual path of, of self-discovery. And if you're deciding things too quickly, that can be very stressful. 
INFPs also have a very strong need for an emotional connection. And comments from an ESTJ means to be helpful or encouraging. They may come out and sound like criticism to an INFP. So these are some of the challenging areas that, that I can think of for this, this pairing. But again, I want to stress there's a lot more that goes into a successful relationship than our Myers-Briggs types. Well, I got to admit, it, it, that was very powerful just as I'm going through it. And boy, I wish that everybody can kind of go through this whole process. When you talked about the challenges stressing me out, yes. Like, like you should have seen my face, right? It was <laughs> crunched up. I was feeling highly stressed out, um, just thinking about how these different things would work out in my real life. And I, I do have friends, not in a romantic relationship with somebody who's an ISTJ, but we work very closely together. And I do understand some of those issues. I, I do understand some of the challenges that I have to have. And it's actually the Myers-Briggs understanding that allows me to understand that we're going to have this conversation, that we're going to have the can I be honest with you conversation? And I know that when somebody says, can I be honest with you? They're not going to say, can I be honest with you? I have great things to say, right? It's, it's normally, can I be honest with you? You got to change, right? You got to. Yeah. You, I mean, saying that, that, like, can I be honest with you? That that can talk about stressing somebody out. Those very words can that are, are likely to stress anybody out, right? But it's yeah. the understanding that I know that that person needs to be yeah. needs to. Right? Yeah. And so that's the reason why it is. And so I can take a deep breath and be prepared for that. Right. But also what you mentioned about the ideas, how these things can can help us. Right. You're right. When we're in social situations and the person's being extroverted and talking all the time and doing all the chit chat and starting all those conversation, it allows me to warm up my chit chat. Right. And I can come in slowly and then eventually I look like him, right? I look like him as an extrovert, right? Because I finally found a topic that I would like to talk about with that individual. And so now I focus on that topic as an introvert, right? So as we talk a little bit about the introvert stuff and like how introverts might be different than extroverts, what about introverts who are with introverts? Are they just sitting around and just talking about things to get all the way down to the bottom? Like, like are they just inside, just in their house, just talking, oh. and watching movies? Like, what are they doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's an interesting question because at face value, it, it might be like we, like we might expect that, right? We might think that two introverts can just blissfully live on their own in their own little cozy cottage and never have to interact with the rest of the world. But the reality is a different story, right? I think two introverts together, they might be great listeners. Um, they're going to likely demonstrate a lot of patience and respect for each other's needs for privacy and quiet. And on the downside, they may lose touch with the outside world if they're not forced to interact with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and on the other hand, they may end up lacking uh, their self-awareness because everything gets filtered into how they see things. So, you know, like everything else in life, there's pros and cons. Absolutely. They got to go into like understanding that relationships there's uh, so many other factors that are involved with that. And even just within the MBTI personality traits, right? We're just looking at one preference, introvert versus extrovert and introverts together. But we can see how if you just change the next letter, an intuitive, right? And a sensor, how that conversation might be different, where we might be discussing stuff and my conversation is very theoretical, is very you know, possibility based and that sort of stuff, very theoretical. And they want more practical, pragmatic sort of conversation, more detail oriented situations. So although we're together, really, really, you know, having good conversation, sometimes we could be talking past each other just on the next preference, right? So, so we're talking about not even just other factors might influence relationships outside of personality, but even within the personality um, that might be the case. And that's why this needs to be used for understanding, not, well, because it has said this, this is exactly what's going to happen. No, it's understanding base. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and definitely bringing in the other dichotomies into it. I mean, it takes on a, a whole other level. And you mentioned sensing and intuitive. I mean, with this pairing, you can have a sensor and an intuitive type looking at the same object and describing it in very different ways. So you think about how that translates into successful communication. It's definitely going to require some patience and understanding there. Great point. You know, as we're having this conversation, it is, I've really been thinking about, you know, I think one of the most important things in a successful relationship, whether they be romantic or platonic, is understanding. I don't know if you've ever read the book, but Franklin Covey, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, he said, seek to understand before being understood. Now, he was using this like number five habit to demonstrate the importance of listening, observing, and using empathic conversation to better understand someone or like a different situation, right? But before trying to prove your own point, okay, you need to be able to understand that individual. And I think that that's so powerful, right? Uh, I really feel like it's a way to improve our social emotional knowledge and skills, which will then help us build relationships. But I think this habit is powerful when it comes to having successful relationships, not just to build you know, these empathic skills and listening skills and that sort of stuff. But I think it's really a core ingredient in having a successful relationship. We need to seek to understand people and who they are so that way we can better take care of one another, right? So, mm -hmm. Edith, what are your thoughts on understanding, like being a core ingredient to our romantic relationships? Yeah, you know, Mark, that's a really good point because regardless of our Myers-Briggs types, there is one thing that we all need in our relationships and that's to be understood. But we all have different needs in a relationship, right? So, okay, so quick example. So my significant other is a very clear introvert and I'll say I'm a moderate extrovert. So he, my significant other is perfectly happy to stay at home for days upon days, watching TV or doing whatever it is that he does. And for me, it's just not going to work all the time. I need to go out and I need to interact with at least one other person <laughs> or preferably a few yeah. people at least once a weekend. And pretty early on, he figured that out. And, and he told me, he said, I know that I can't be everything for you. You have some needs that I just can't fulfill. So there are times when I just do my thing and he just does his thing and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the key is to approach these conversations with curiosity mm -hmm. rather than judgment. I mean, it's easy for me to say that it's unhealthy for a grown man to be spending so much time in his man cave, <laughs> but yeah. you know, that's my own filter and it's based on my own needs. It, yeah, it just, I really think it comes down to understanding, right? And we know there's a bunch of things that goes into love, right? Like when we say, I love you and you're the person that I love and you're the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. We know there's more to that than just personality based. But I do feel like when we get to that level of love, the fun journey is the understanding of one another, is the really getting a chance to really understand who that person is, what they need, and maybe what they don't need from me, right? And to understand that they're different than me. And I'm willing to either give them what they need or maybe not do that or even understand that that person is probably not going to give that to me, like you spoke about in your example. So I need to seek it out in other ways. Like it's the journey of life where we're always essentially enjoying life. And I love that idea that relationships should be taking us on like a journey through life. And it's really coming through an idea of understanding and helping a lot of times when I talk about relationships, I talk about climbing a mountain, right? Climbing Mount Everest. There's a certain amount of understanding you need to have in order to scale that mountain. You can't just, <laughs> well, I mean, that person's not doing it the way I want to do it. So I'm just not going to, like, I'm, we're not going to do that. No, like we have to do things together and we have to understand each other's strengths, their weaknesses, what they need and what they don't need in order to successfully climb and scale the mountain, right? So I just think about, because of course I'm an intuitive and I want to imagine a certain world, but imagine a world where our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our husbands, wives, 
lovers need us with understanding and not with judgment. Like not this whole idea of needing to be right all the time and proving a point and wanting to be understood, but seek to understand where we're coming from and what we're trying to accomplish. I think that would tr provide us with such great safety in our relationships, which would then allow us to grow and to journey in our path towards self-actualization. Yeah. You know, when you say it like that, it sounds so easy, <laughs> but especially like when we're in the heat of the moment, it's really not. And then we're all prone to our own biases because we're human. But it's my hope just by us talking about this, that people can start to develop more of an awareness around these topics and they can use that understanding to build better relationships with each other. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, you know, in the last episode, I spoke about an example of my brother, right? And mm -hmm. how we will get into these misunderstandings, but because of my knowledge of MBTI and my thorough, always trying to understand people from that scope, right? From that kind of perspective, how it's really helped us in how we relate with each other. And so one of the things I was thinking about this week is the MBTI process might actually help us with our understanding muscles. Like, so when we're trying to figure out our MBTI preferences and types and how my preferences might impact myself, others, and situations, I'm building my understanding muscles. When I'm using my MBTI knowledge to figure out others' MBTI preferences and types and using that knowledge to provide a better situation, I'm building my, my understanding muscles. I'm getting stronger. I'm getting better. I'm putting load on and I'm getting stronger to the point where it becomes easy. And like we talked about, like, like a lot of you guys know my brother's an extrovert. So when we're on a vacation, I'm trying to figure out the different type of places he wants to go because I know he wants to experience things. He just doesn't want to sit in the house. So because I built my understanding muscles, I understand that and I want to create those things so that way he can experience it. And he's trying to figure out when he needs to schedule breaks for me because I'm an introvert, right? So he knows that Mark, 45 minutes, that's all he's got. Like Mark needs a break and he understands that when I escape, he's probably not coming back for another 15 minutes. That understanding has allowed us to better relate with each other. And then I so much appreciate him. And that appreciate only deepens my love for my brother, right? And what he is because of just being able to go through that understanding stuff, right? And being able to do that. We're both feelers. So when we take a trip to visit our parents, we both know that we don't mind talking about, you know, how our year has been going and giving each other the needed empathy. But we can't do this for too long because he's going to get tired of my theoretical conversations. And I'm going to get tired of his very detailed stories that includes like what the sun looked like. Like I know we're both going to get tired of that. So about two hours into the trip, it's time for him to do his thing. And it's time for me to do my thing. Right. But that's the power of understanding and how it impacts relationships for the positive. And I think it's so important for us to understand that because if we're able to understand that we can better relate with each other. Right. And like I've always said, always start with, you know, do no harm. Right. And also being considerate. If you start there, then you're going to be able to be in a position to be able to provide your understanding to better relate, right? My brother always says our relationship is better than most married couples because we choose to live by some of the fundamentals. First, do no harm, like I just spoke about. And second, be considerate at all times. And the third, to seek to understand before under being understood. I wonder if we actually leaned into those rules, like actually really were intentional about living by those rules if our relationships would not just be better in life. Overall, if people if people could follow that, I mean, I think we'd see great things from that. And, you know, I, I just want to say that I thought that was such a fantastic example that you gave, Mark, about the uh, <laughs> comment for that you guys are like an old married couple. That's pretty funny. And I, I think that um, understanding our own personality type and others types can absolutely help in providing a way to support and to forgive each other. And I really like your analogy of understanding muscles because muscles need to be strengthened and they need to be built up, right? And on the other hand, if we don't use them, they're going to get weaker. No doubt. Like, and so, but you're so right though. Like 
although we say this and it seems easy to understand, we are human beings, right? So forgive me if I'm trying to make this seem so oversimplistic because we're human <laughs> beings filled with emotions and hurts and that sort of stuff. And it forces us to do things we don't necessarily want to do. But I just want to, I just really felt compelled to really talk about just this whole idea of, of seeking to understand. And I really think that seeking to understand also allows us to live by the platinum rule, right? Treat others the way they want to be treated and allow spouses to satisfy each other's needs. I really think that's really important. And by having the foundation of seeking to understand, it allows us to do those, those two things. I can't treat you the way you want to be treated and satisfy your needs if I don't have a strong understanding of who you are. So I'd say my job in the relationship is to use my strong understanding muscles to understand who you are, your personality, your strengths, understand the purposes um, behind your emotions, your motivations and actions, understand the things that make you who you are and add value to your life through treating you the way you want to be treated and satisfying your needs emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And people will say, well, that's really, really a high bar, right? And that sort of stuff. But part of me feels like we kind of do that with our best friends. Like I'm in middle school and like best friends are doing that. They're, they're taking time to understand their best friend's problems. They're finding ways to satisfy that best friend's emotional needs. So if my middle school girls can do it, like I feel like the person that we love, like we should do that too. And again, people are like, well, Mark, you're not married. So... Like you're, you're setting this high bar. You haven't really experienced it. But here's what I'd say. Even though I haven't experienced it, let's have a ideal feel of what it can be because that's what allows us to be motivated to reach that sort of stuff, right? So I, I think that's really, really important. So although I've set a high bar when it comes to spouse's responsibility in romantic relationships, I think I, I just kind of want the audience to understand that if you just aim to seek to understand before being understood with empathy and consideration, it will lead to other actions. And it's this behavior that will lead to an environment of safety, love, and trust that we all crave and that allows our loved ones to grow and become everything that they're capable of becoming. Yeah. Your passion for this is like, I can hear it in your voice. I, I'm sure everybody tuning in can hear this in your voice. And it, it's just so inspiring, Mark. And I'm recalling as you're as you're talking how you and I have sit together many times. And, you know, I'm just going on and on and on about whatever it is that I'm talking about. And you're often very quiet, but you're looking at me very intently. And I, I can feel the understanding there. I can mm. feel the validation there. And it's really helpful. And like you're saying there, that's the, the I think the first part in a relationship. And I, I love how you brought your middle school students into this because this is something where we often see young people, they have naturally. And somehow mm. as, we, as we get older and we, we lose it and, it and it's such a shame. I really don't like to see that at all. And if um, more people could just come back to these very simple, it sounds like, again, it sounds like very simple principles. I think the world would be better for it. And, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we are, we're, we're unique individuals. Um, we all have our unique struggles, but I think the value in what you're talking about here, Mark, about understanding first, first understanding ourselves better. Um, and then through that understanding, we can see things about ourselves that can help us move forward, things that we need to work on. And let's face it, almost all, all of us can work on becoming better listeners and better empathizers. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. And we can also see why we gravitate towards certain people and certain relationships. And sometimes we have to flex our styles, meaning we have to adjust to other people because we value the relationship. And simply watching people and observing certain behavioral cues and, and gradually adjusting your style to that person's style. So mirroring them, this can really help in relating to people who are different from, from ourselves. It can help us to communicate and understand each other better. And 
you know, as I, I'm talking about mirroring here, there is a downside to that. And it can be exhausting if we do it too much, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, we're all human and we all want to be accepted for who we are most naturally and comfortably. I love how you mentioned that at the end. Like, that's our ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. Like, we want to be accepted for who we are, right? And and just when we feel that, when we feel that people accept us for who we are, it allows us to feel that we can accomplish everything. A, a story that I mentioned that I want to just mention about one of my favorite basketball players of all time is Kobe Bryant. And, and Kobe Bryant wasn't always a great basketball player. He he grew up in, in Italy and played basketball. And when he came back to Philadelphia, his dad, who was a former NBA player, put him in a really, really competitive league, right? And Kobe said he was like 11, and he's playing in a group of probably 13 people. I'm oh, sorry, not 13 people, 13, age 13. And, and he said that, like, during that whole year, he didn't score a point. Not a free throw, mm-hmm. not a lucky tip in. Not nothing like Kobe Bryant, one of the best scorers of all time, didn't score a point, and he was devastated because he's, you know, nobody knows who he is, and he's coming from a new area, and 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 he's he's trying to get acclimated and transition back in the U.S. and he feels like he's letting down his dad, right, who was a former NBA player mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff. So he feels terrible, and he said that he had a conversation with his dad, and his dad said, you know what, Kobe, like I don't care if you score a point. I will always love you. And mm. and Kobe said the love that he felt uh, like when he received that to understand that even in his failure, he was going to be accepted for who he was, provided him with the foundation to feel like, you know what? No, no, dad, like I'm going to score some points, but thank <laughs> you. They let me know that I can take risks in life and I can do certain things in order to be successful. And so like when we talk about relationships and its importance, that's what it all comes down to. The question is, how do we get to that? And that's what we're discussing in this show. And so it's not about taking a compatibility test, right? And try to figure out like, well, that person's perfect for me. And we're going to automatically like have a good relationship. No, bro. Like, like, no, like you got to do some work, right? Like you're going to have to go through and really love that person to do that, to give that person that safety so that way they can become everything they're capable of becoming, take the risk, grow, so they can reach where they need to go. And when we reach that level, we so much appreciate that person. That to me, when it comes down to it, our love is so immense. It's unbelievable. And as human beings, that's what we're seeking, right? And that's what we're coming, and that's what we're trying to get accomplished. And why I really, I'm really so thrilled that we're ending our podcast season, you know, you know, first season together just really, really speaking about the relationship to how building our understanding muscles through MBTI can make us such better relators of people and help us in our relationships. So just to kind of wrap up a little bit, which I felt like I've kind of kind of done there, right? Like <laughs> I, I really do believe in that that understanding is a foundation of care, empathy, and love. And, and when we are able to understand people who are all unique, it informs us and how we are to behave, right? It's almost like we're doctors. The best medical doctors are excellent at understanding what's going on so that way they can give the best care for patients. That's who we are for each other. We're doctors to the soul. Like doctors are medical examiners for the physical body. We become the doctors of the soul where we can best understand people and then help them figure out the the best care for them, which may not include us. You know, it may not include us being a part of that process, but we help them become that. So that's really, really important. And I just feel like if we decided to live like this, trying to understand others, who they are and how they are all unique and allow that understanding to inform our actions toward them, we can definitely provide the best care for them. Yeah. 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 Well said, Mark. And and with that, we're going to be wrapping things up here. And Mark, this is a wrap up of our first season together. So yay for us. Yeah, absolutely. It's been it's been great, Edith. I feel like our interactions been great. And most important, our personality types say that we weren't going to get this podcast done and we were able to get it. So we flexed <laughs> yeah. some other preference muscles in order to get this accomplished. So I'm proud of us. 
Yeah. Yep. Likewise. Likewise. Yep. So big thanks to you, Mark. And folks who are tuning in, if you have made it to the end of this, thank you. Big thanks. I'm going to ask another favor of you. Please like this episode, subscribe to the podcast and share the episode with others. That way we know we can continue bringing you great content in our next season. We appreciate you all tuning in and supporting us. Thanks again and take care. Thanks for tuning in. Follow us on social media and your favorite podcast platform. And please reach out to me on LinkedIn and on my website, atopcareer.com for more updated content. While the Myers-Briggs and MBTI are trademarks of the Myers-Briggs Foundation, viewpoints expressed here are our own.